The promise of Bitcoin was digital currency, and that has now evolved into more of an asset than a currency, currency in the sense of something that can be used to readily make payments. But Bitcoin is really becoming more of a, an asset that maintains, holds value, and then continues to increase in value over time uh, due to built-in algorithmic scarcity. But the real contribution of Bitcoin was opening everyone's eyes to the power of the blockchain, a decentralized structure, a decentralized database that could be immutable. In other words, whatever you write into it could not be changed after that record was entered. It could be updated, but you would see the entire chain of how a record or a value evolved over time. Previous rights cannot be undone they will always be part of the record. This type of data structure, which is not owned or hosted at any one server, but rather jointly owned and hosted by an entire network, a community of providers. And secondly, where these participants on the Bitcoin network don't require industrial grade or commercial grade hardware and networks to be a node for the blockchain. That was also a very important uh, factor in the success of Bitcoin because it lowered the bar for participation. So the blockchain has brought with it many innovations. And early participants in the Bitcoin network looked at the power of what blockchain might enable. And then, as is quite often the case in technology, uh, had their own flights of fancy beyond the Bitcoin platform, beyond the blockchain platform. And one such project, one such team, was the Ethereum team. Uh, and the Ethereum team came up with the idea of developing the blockchain further into not just a decentralized database that kept all records going back in time, uh, change histories, and that was immutable, but also a compute infrastructure that would allow actual code to execute in a decentralized way. This evolved into the idea for a world computer. A world computer in the sense that it would be a computer made up of individual nodes, individual computers, relatively low-end computers, that would all be connected on networks of different types with different latencies and different amounts of bandwidth. And all of them collectively would contribute to the Ethereum capacity. And then the Ethereum virtual machine would essentially run and span across many of these systems so that the code that you were trying to execute within this world computer would use the virtual machine as an intermediary to the underlying hardware. As more hardware became available, more resources on the network became available, these programs that you were running, written in a language called Solidity, would have access to a greater amount of compute, memory, storage capacity. And of course, integrated into all of this is a blockchain style database as well, something that can keep track of entries and so on and so forth. But again, with Bitcoin, we got decentralized storage. With Ethereum, we got decentralized storage plus world computers, uh, this idea of global computation on a decentralized network. Now, if you zoom out and you look at the technological contribution of something like this, one might argue that in distributed systems, a lot of work has been done on message passing, on resource pooling, resource sharing, shared file systems, but arguably also the amount of um, participation, the level of scale of the Ethereum network is probably unprecedented. So there are definitely technical contributions of a significant nature, not to mention all the cryptographic cleverness that secures such a network against attack and protects data and so on and so forth. But the other contribution is actually a social and structural contribution, which is that Ethereum shows a way for us to build a world computer made up of individually unimpressive nodes and assets, uh, somebody's individual PC or a small business's server, certainly not supercomputers, certainly not the world's most powerful computers, and yet create an abstraction over them so that they become a very secure, reliable, fault-tolerant, distributed, decentralized compute system. 
This, in many ways, could be an alternative to the centralized cloud architecture where a small number of companies own, essentially, all the meaningful data centers in the world, where maybe four or five companies become the only platforms on which startups and even large businesses deploy and deliver their software and their solutions. This, I think, is a dangerous trend where we are giving up a lot of information, a lot of metadata about our applications, about our user traffic, about our patterns of usage through the day, about the demographics of our traffic over to just four or five companies. And we're also encouraging them to use our success, the load, the bandwidth, the user base that we bring to their platforms to continue to grow their platforms to earn money from that usage and then continue to invest in these systems so that the difference between us and them continues to increase. So structurally, centralized computing in a world where all computing is now a big chunk of the economy and will become an ever larger percentage of the global economy, this is a dangerous phenomenon. With decentralized systems, we can actually live in a world where individuals can contribute computation, where we can have a world computer that can be used to deploy applications, and most interestingly, have people that are, have contributed their resources to this world computer be compensated for that contribution. Tokens are a way to provide compensation to people that have become part of that network. And the dream, the goal of Ethereum was to build exactly such a world computer which would utilize what are called gas fees, small payments, small crypto payments, uh, in order to make use of resources. And those payments would go back to people that have contributed the capacity, the computational infrastructure to enable the world computer to begin with. So everyone, theoretically, can now participate in this network. You don't need supercomputers. You don't need tremendous amounts of capital. You don't need to be like Microsoft or Google or Amazon and buy you know, billion-dollar data centers. You can be an ordinary person, and you can contribute capacity that will have uh, uh, a payment associated with it that will make your computer a source of income for you while also not ceding over all control to just one, two, or four companies. This is a good thing. But now let's come to the practicality of why something like Ethereum in its current form really can't deploy applications at scale and really can't support latencies and modes of operation that people expect, say, of a web app. Now, Technically, could you deploy an Ethereum web app as part of a smart contract? And every time you go to a browser, it uses a plugin or an external service to resolve your um, ENS uh, name, which is a crypto name service, uh, to a particular address, then go to that address or load something from the blockchain and try to invoke a smart contract get some content back from that smart contract and render it in a browser. Could you do that? Yes, you could. Would it be tremendously slow? Yes, it would. Would it be tremendously expensive? Probably it would, because the way that the Ethereum network is set up right now, small transactions, just making an entry into a database, into the ledger, those things are tolerable. You can pay gas fees and that kind of works. But when it comes to running smart contracts as programs, as full-fledged website um, you know, uh, components, then at that point, you start in, uh, uh, spending gas fees that make the entire system impractical. So this is to say that the idea of a world computer, a decentralized system like the one that Ethereum has envisaged, that is a global good. But there needs to be a lot more work done in order to scale these systems up to where they will support near real-time application uh, execution, near real-time application uh, interfaces and interchanges with the user. Uh, it's got to be to the point where it's running like a website runs. Now, a website is centralized, yes. So we need to move to a decentralized architecture, but we can't penalize uh, end users and we can't ruin the end user experience in doing so. 
Now, there are lots of areas to explore for people interested. For example, how really do you do decentralized name services? How really do you do the deployment of code that can be executed at a variety of nodes uh, in a secure way, in a way that prevents that code from being modified? And also, how do you distribute data that the code needs to operate on in a secure way to a variety of nodes that might be contributing to the computation that uh, causes that code to run? How will you solve problems of this type? Now, luckily, in computer science, there are already many algorithms, mechanisms, systems that have been built, uh, maybe at smaller scale, but algorithmically still very sound, that address some of these problems. In my view, the next few years of engineering in the crypto space, in the decentralized or Web3 space, as it's called, will have to focus on infrastructure challenges around speed, ease of deployment, and scalability of application execution inside the decentralized structure, inside the decentralized world computer itself. The concepts are there, the intent is there, the community is there, but the performance and the code that will enable what we need is not yet there.